It's time for our second hot topic on the breakfast. Glad you are still there. Um, well, licensed customs agents are projecting and a 15% rise in car import from tax removal. And uh, Basil Abia has joined us. He's a research associate, Kwakol Research Abuja. Good morning to you, Basil. Good morning, madam. All right. So good to have you here as always, Basile. You were here with me on Monday and it was quite uh, a great discussion we had. Now let's talk about this new development. Is this good news, do you think? They believe that this uh, removal of the import adjustment tax by President Bola Ahmed is going to encourage the importation of more vehicles, not as much as it would have had the uh, NARA rate not been changed. However, uh, they believe that no matter what, at least 10 to 15 percent uh, of more imports will take place for cars. How, what's your take on this? Um, I think we would have to temper excitement a bit. Um, is it good news to always reduce uh, tax le uh, levies, especially for very important utility in this context, uh, automobiles? Um, yes, I, I mean, it is good news. Uh, however, there's context that needs to be provided in this case. Uh, first and foremost, as you, as you rightly mentioned, uh, the devaluation of the Naira uh, by, you know, more than 30%, if I'm not mistaken, is going to affect the rate at which uh, we expect people to be able to import cars, right? Um, the rationale behind the levies itself, the import levies on automobiles, was uh, as a result of this protectionist idea that governments uh, from time immemorial always had about protecting our local uh, automobile industry. Unfortunately, I do not think that's the economically appropriate way to go about developing a local automobile industry. I think what you need to do first and foremost is to ensure that there is uh, um, appropriate capital formation as well as skill set formation uh, with regards to automobile manufacturing. When you are able to do that, then you are able to have an ecosystem that can compete. Um, other that, uh, aside that, you also have to make sure that the structural issues that bedevil local manufacturing are cleared. First and foremost, what do I mean by that? Um, it is super expensive to have reliable electricity just to run your factories for 10 hours, not to talk about 12 hours. Or, in fact, the last I remember, Innocent even had to start rationing uh, the amount of uh, hours that they were using to power their factories to continue manufacturing. So if the largest automobile manufacturer in Nigeria is having to ration due to energy costs, imagine what it is for small, other smaller players like Nord or you know, uh, um, the folks at Equity that do uh, Proforce who manufacture uh, defense automobile uh, 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 units. So um, we have to actually look at that industry with this laser focus uh, economic thinking rather than say, okay, let's just slap import duties and hope that we can defend our local automobile industry. Um, we would see some improvement in terms of importation of automobiles, but I don't think that is going to be the priority or prerogative of the local demand market. I think the local demand market will still stick around buying uh, uh, second-hand, third-hand, and fourth-hand Nigerian-used cars. And what I mean by that is that maybe a neighbor wants to sell their car because they feel it's no longer relevant or imp economically important anymore due to the uh, removal of subsidy and the high cost of PMS. Uh, that would ensure that they would sell at giveaway price. And that, I think that's how uh, the, the demand market for automobiles will be able to survive in this very harsh price shocks environment. Um, it's always good, again, I would have to reiterate, it's always good to, to remove import levies, especially for important utilities like this, where you don't have competitive advantage. Um, I think if you don't have competitive advantage in a particular commodity, in a, a particular utility, and then you slap um, tax levies or import duties on the importation of these particular uh, uh, commodities or units, what you're basically doing is you're practicing economic protectionism. And that is a very 1970s antiquated um, economic pathway or policy to look out uh, for. Except you have competitive advantage and the technology is a niche technology. For instance, say artificial intelligence or a particular defense uh, 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 um, technology that you have that barely anyone has. For instance, maybe you have like competitive advantage in drone technology, uh, like how Turkey has. 
that's when I would say it's appropriate for you to put some of those um, economic protectionist policies because what you're trying to do is you're trying to ensure that your leverage uh, in terms of global dominance for that commodity or for that technology is still maintained. But in our case, we don't have any leverage. We don't have any competitive advantage. We don't do original engineering when it comes to automobile engineering. What we actually do is we take the parts from different parts of the world, we couple them, uh, and then we fine tune them, of course, and then we sell them. And we don't even do enough of those units um, in that sense. I remember when I used to do uh, research for a technology firm um, early to 2017, I had to access database, the database for um, FRSC, you know, in their headquarters here in Abuja. And the, the numbers I looked at were not really good. When we, we, Nigeria, uh, as at that time in 2017, we, didn't, we were not importing more than 10,000 units mm. of new cars, new automobiles, while our own economic peer, South Africa, were doing more than 100,000 units every year. And I'm sure that number is lower now. So if you're doing less than 10,000 units, and even if you reduce uh, or remove import levies, I'm not convinced that you're going to even have uh, higher numbers in that sense due to, uh, of course, the price shocks, due to the removal of subsidy, due to the, um, the, 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 the cost-reflective electricity tariffs, and then, of course, the devaluation of the Naira. That, that, that's my take on, on, on uh, the new announcement. Yeah, I, I like the way you've situated it. It's, it's, it's like a sweet and sour pork kind of situation, isn't it? Uh, it would you agree with some who have said that uh, the government has missed a good opportunity to boost local production of cars, increase IGR and employment for, 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 for Nigeria? Wait, you, mean, you mean the removal of the... Import le uh, levy. Yeah, because some are saying instead of removing this, what the government should have done would have been to subsidize local car manufacturers, like Innocent that you've mentioned, for instance. Well, I, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, I've always been on the school of thought and the, the opinion that uh, a better way to incentivize local production is to sort out the supply side constraints. In economics, what supply side constraints basically means is uh, situational uh, uh, impediments or hurdles that are preventing uh, producers from supplying to meet demand. And from an automobile manufacturing perspective, uh, what that actually means is that can Innocent be able to comfortably run their factories at least for 18 hours per day, you know, at, at a re relative marginal cost where um, it doesn't really affect their unit economics? You know, uh, where the cost of production uh, is far lower than the, uh, the amount of earnings they are making from selling a unit of an innocent car. And they are, they are hurdles to being able to do 18 hours of uh, production, being able to access cheap and reliable energy, being able to access cheap, uh, skilled uh, workforce. You have to be able to make sure that the, the power situation in the country dramatically uh, and geometrically increases. You know, we're doing less than 5,000 megawatts every day, actively, in terms of uh, power generation uh, and supply. Our grid cannot take more than 8,000 megawatts uh, in any moment of time. It's just that we don't, we have antiquated grid infrastructure. We are not producing enough energy, and then we are not enabling an electricity market where Innocent can decide to invest in a hybrid electricity uh, production unit where they use solar and then mix it with solid waste. And, you know, you know, all of these things. Obviously, now with the Nigeria Electricity Act, you know, someone will now be able to en engage in that. But it's still expensive because if you want to engage in solar, there are import levies, uh, levies and, uh, and duties on solar equipment and components. So everywhere you look at, there's an impediment caused by a particular policy. That yeah, that, that's part of the well, reasons why people are saying... Yeah, that's part, part of the reasons why people are saying that local manufacturing should be thoroughly encouraged. For instance, the importation of these uh, 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 solar things, if they are manufactured here in Nigeria, it will fix this issue of power, this issue of alternative energy that local companies like Innocent and the rest are facing. Well, with regards to solar equipment, only Oxano Solar manufactures solar equipment in Nigeria, and they're not even ready with their factory. Should I tell you why? It is super expensive to manufacture in Nigeria. So we need to fix the structural issues. That's just the honest truth. You know, we need to fix the structural issues. We cannot 
say we want to defend a local manufacturing industry when we are not producing up to 25,000 megawatts per day, at least. So once we get those numbers up, I'm telling you, every, almost everything will align. If you tell a manufacturer in Vietnam to come over to Nigeria mm. and manufacture, and you have at least 25,000 uh, megawatts of electricity being produced, you don't have the situation where there are over 200 informal taxes in the country and over 60 formal taxes in the country. In mm. some industries, you're paying as much as 20 taxes. When you are able to streamline taxation, when you are able to ensure taxation is easier, swifter, is automated, when you're able to make sure there's no multiplicity of taxation, when you're able to ensure that power is easy to access, you know, is affordable. Even if it's not affordable, it is accessible and it is reliable. You are getting 24 hours, seven days uh, a week electricity. And it is quality electricity. It's not some half-stage uh, voltage, but full voltage that doesn't hurt any of your equipment. Then you can now attract manufacturers from Vietnam. Then you can now incentivize local production. So I think we're losing the bigger picture. And as an economist or, or, or someone who is um, an enthusiast of economics, very good economics, mm -hmm. from a macroeconomics perspective, you have to look at the macro first before you dive in into the micro. And the macro, we're not concentrating on that. We're just diving into the very minute details. Oh, let's put an import duty here so that we can increase. You know, that's the same economic mentality that was behind the closure of our land borders. We thought that if we closed land borders, and we thought that if we ensured that food importers didn't have access to foreign exchange, local production was going to increase. Well, here you go. Food production has reduced um, over the last three years, you know, exponentially due to these structural issues. We have security situation, you know. Okay, imagine Innocent now, for instance. With the security situation in the Southeast, how do you want them to attract highly skilled talent to manufacture those cars, you know? Obviously, skilled talent would say, okay, I'm going to London to work because it's safer there than, say, working in Nairi or in Onicha, you know, for instance. So all of these structural issues, they, they, they dive in. We need to sort out security issues. We need to make sure that there's uh, a, a affordable or at least accessible and reliable electricity. We need to make sure that our tax system is uniform and is automated. You know, there's no issue with informal taxes or agrarians coming to disturb or, you know, people from the street saying, where is our own Onire but for the day, for instance? You know, if you're in Lagos and you're in manufacturing in Lagos, all of these factors tie into why it is really hard to manufacture. I do not think that the best way to approach this is to add more import duties or maybe remove import duties and say, you know, um, yeah, we need to look at it from a structural issue. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think that's the thinking right now of most of our policymakers. All right, very interesting analysis there, Abia. Now, well, th these licensed customs agents are also seeking for a review of the 7% port development levy. They are spot on. They are actually spot on, you know. I, again, it dives back into, uh, or it piggybacks off my, my, my conversation about the multiplicity of taxation in Nigeria. You know, you go into certain industries, and I'm telling you this, from a legal and compliance perspective, I have a couple of friends who are uh, compliance officers for, for companies. The, no, the amount of taxes they have to pay, formally and informally, you know, it doesn't really make sense. It's almost like extortion. They, the, 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 the right economy thinking about taxes or taxation mm. is that first and foremost, produ production or productivity is incentivized so that you can tax the benefits of that productivity that you've incentivized. Mm -hmm. In the case, for instance, of the port development le uh, levy, our ports are not even functioning at optimal capacity. You know, you're, you're not doing, you're not doing uh, eight hours of uploading uh, from the berth, of course, the, the containers, and then uh, getting uh, the commodities out of the containers. We, we're not yet reaching those Rotterdam uh, port levels. You know, nearby ports like Lomé, or the ports in, 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 in Porto Novo, or the ports mm -hmm. in, even in, in, in Tema, they're, they're functioning even more optimally than our ports. Our ports are not decongested. They need to be decongested. Um, there's a, the, the traffic log jam there, the, 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 the logistical log jams happening, especially around Apapa and Tinkan, Tinkan Island ports. If you're not sorting out these structural issues, then where is the impetus, where is the incentive for people to say, we're going to pay that 7% port development levy? I think that's a wrong, 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 uh, wrong uh, signal that we're sending to, to that particular industry, the maritime industry. 
and and, and the, the port operators, the, 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 these agents are right. They are right to be able to argue that um, the seven percent port development levy should be reviewed. Of course, of course. And again, this also trickles down into why buying cars, especially secondhand Belgian-based cars or cars from uh, from Japan or original car units from the U.S., are like super expensive because the more you add this multiplicity of taxation, the more you have add these import duties, there is a price transmission into how much we're paying. Mm -hmm. Not to talk of the, uh, the, the, the current devaluation of the Naira or the fact that the Naira is no longer highly valued in, uh, on the market. So all of these add down together to the issue that we have with regards uh, affordability of our cars. And these agents are spot on about that. I think that uh, they're right to push for a review of the, those, those levies. But I, I don't think that the body language of the federal government right now is one to think about removing those, those levies. So uh, we need to rethink how we do taxation in Nigeria. That's what I'll say. Yeah, talking about the affordability of these cars, whether they get to import 10% more or 15% more, how affordable would they be is the question. Uh, a journalist uh, did some sort of investigation around this and discovered from these car dealers, the car dealers, that not many people are coming to their shops anymore. How are they going to even sell these vehicles if they do get them imported because of the prevailing economic realities on ground today? Uh, hello, sorry about that. I think it was an uh, internet uh, glitch. And, uh, and back, back, to, back to your point, uh, Madam. Uh, I'll be honest with you. When, whenever you're going through uh, price shocks, what Nigeria is currently witnessing is a price shock because we carried out three to four macroeconomic policy reforms at the same time, mm. you know. And now we're also introducing informal taxation uh, via VAT, where we're charging um, informal traders VAT taxes. All of these things trickle down in the macroeconomy to ensure that purchasing power is stimmed, and then there's no incentive to want to spend outside of the basics. So what you're currently seeing right now with regards to the car industry, um, for a lot of these agents, like the journalist was able to find out, uh, first and foremost, is that people who would usually think of buying cars right now at this time of the year are no longer thinking of doing that because there's an upward review of the amount they have to spend for PMS, for fuel. You know, um, important to, 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 to add that uh, um, fuel prices have increased by over 190%. We, our, our research team actually did the calculation across board nationally at least 190 percent increase in the last two months imagine that shock to your pocket and that there's that transmission to even what you're paying uh for instance with regards to public transport or private transport so when you do that and then you have an inflation rate of about uh 22 percent and then you have a food inflation rate of about 24 percent and increasing and then you have the devaluation uh of the naira you add all of this even if you have two million in your pocket you're first thinking of how you can secure at least the next one year, your rent for the next year, because you know your rent is going to increase again, maybe by 20%. You know you're going to spend more on, 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 on transportation. You're going to spend more on food. And you want to survive, right? You want to eat well, right? Mm. So that middle class that usually would have the 2 million, the 1.5 million to, or the 3 million to buy those cars, are saying, and, and, and human beings are rational thinkers. That's what classic economics uh, teaches us that we're rational thinkers. In fact, that's why they, in, in economics, we're taught opportunity cost and preferential order. Those two, two concepts in, in basic economics, anyone who has done basic economics in secondary school, your first thought, uh, preferential order and opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. That's the way we human beings think. So rational thinking right now, for most of the demand side of the automobile industry in Nigeria, is saying, I want to be able to secure my feeding cost for the next six months, because obviously, as human beings, you want to survive first before you drive a nice car, right? That's exactly what's happening in transmitting is that in uh, the ability of the demand side to be able to afford or acquire these cars. But for the next nine months, we're going to see the automobile industry in Nigeria badly hit. And it's largely because of the price shocks due to the macroeconomic policy reforms carried out by the Tinubu uh, administration. And not uh, until market forces begin to uh, determine the foreign exchange rate, we may not begin to see enough changes to um, reflect on 
the price of gari, the price of cars, the price of tomato, the price of that. And you're thinking we may not be able to see all of that in place until, say, nine months from now. Actually, let me even be more realistic. Um, because we're also predicting our macroeconomic outlook should be out next, next week, uh, Quarko okay. Research. And we're predicting that the, um, the, 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 the stability or the stabilization of the economy after all of these price shocks will take at least 12 months. So let's give months. it one year. Yeah, that's our prediction. Our prediction is that the uh, price transmission would take maximum effect uh, by the 12th month. So in one year, we should see some, some stabilization. Um, and this is in the hope and in the constant factor that our oil prices, that global oil prices don't fall below $70 per barrel. Because mm. obviously our economy is still heavily shaped on our oil exports. And we do not... Uh, 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 produce anything lower than 1.3 million barrels. Um, reports from, um, if I'm not mistaken, reports from last week um, or early this week says that we, we hit 1.4 million barrels in production, oil production, uh, for the last month. So that's a good number. Uh, however, we should be aiming to go back to our 2010 uh, era, uh, 2 million or 2.4 million barrels per day. Um, we have not done that in years, and uh, it's affecting the, our economy, and that's just the honest truth. Also, we need to ramp up diversification, but you don't expect diversification to happen in 12 months, right? Mm. You expect that to start to happen in three to four years. Uh, so for the meantime, let's ensure that we don't reduce oil production uh, by any means. Let's also ensure and pray that something doesn't happen, and, uh, and then oil prices go lower than $70. When these things happen, then I think uh, with some common sense, uh, macroeconomic management from the Tinubu team, we could see that stabilization happen in 12 months. However, I'm not betting on this government to be able to make the, the right decisions for the next nine months, and we could even see things go worse. So, for Nigerians, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know how to put it, but um, things are going to be really hard. Yeah, Nigerians have been told to continue to tighten the belt and tighten the belt. Although some are beginning to say, where's the waist that the belt, <laughs> the waist has shrunk to the point that you, there may just not be anywhere to tighten it any further. But still, Abia, thank you so much for your time on The Breakfast this morning. Thank you. It's always a privilege to be on The Breakfast Show. Thank you. Yeah, I've been speaking with Basil Abia, Research Associate, Kwako Research, Abuja. Well, before we go... We're going to give you our quote of the day. Of course, this is the much you can give you today and indeed this week on The Breakfast. But if you've joined us from Monday to today, I'm sure you would agree with me that it's been a splendid time on The Breakfast this week. And our quote for the day, Eleanor Roosevelt, he says, If life were predictable, it would cease to be life and be without flavor. That's Eleanor Roosevelt. If life were predictable, it would cease to be life and be without flavor. I am Maureen Menongwe Zigo. Thank you so much for being there for us. Join us again next week on The Breakfast. Do have a great weekend. Bye.